What's up guys, Quinn Hennick here, just giving you a little rundown of the caseload that I saw at Clinical Athlete Newport. I get questions about the demographic of patients that I see at a small cash-based clinic inside of a weightlifting gym. And so today was uh, a decent example of the types of athletes that come into the clinic. So first off, we had a male in his 30s who is a recreational weightlifter and has been training that way for about a year, powerlifting for years before that, and strength training for years before that. Has a history of bilateral patellar tendinopathy, which is uh, managed and in control currently, and he came into the clinic with uh, right wrist pain with the overhead position in the snatch and the overhead squat, and bilateral hip sensitivity in the bottom of the squat. So. Wrist range of motion, all normal, able to produce force in, in various planes, shoulder range of motion, all normal. The wrist was sensitive to compression plus extension, compression plus radial deviation, essentially the mimicking the position of the overhead squat or the snatch. Jerks are pain-free, so that more narrow grip was more comfortable on the wrist. We played around with wrist position in the overhead squat and just straighten them up a little bit and that relieves some uh, sensitivity a, a little bit. And also notice that he was just a little bit, kind of the entire lock out of the elbow and the shoulder during the overhead squat was just a little soft. So just cued a uh, active reach against the bar plus a little bit of change in wrist angle and bringing in the hands just a little bit, just temporarily to take some heat off of that wrist. And talked about adding in some focused wrist extension and then radial deviation, maybe even just holding a, a PVC pipe or a hammer and just trying to load those tissues into that position. But ultimately this is kind of a, a compression sensitivity, just a positional sensitivity. So we alter the position, try to uh, distribute forces a little bit more evenly through the upper extremity to dissipate some of that concentrated force right there at the wrist. And then some, some focused, uh, great exposure to load in that area. We'll see if that makes a dent. But I think just cleaning up his, his positions in general may help. We did the same thing with his squat. Uh, he's able to achieve depth. The hips, the range of motion is fine in the hips. He's just kind of sensitive to the bottom position. And so uh, we played around with the squat stance, played around with wide, narrow, toes in, toes out, hiked his heels up with plates even underneath his shoes and uh, really just honed in his position, got him to sit just straight down into the squat, which took some heat off of the hips, took some of his depth away, so brought him out of the hole just a little bit, uh, found a groove in his squat stance that was a little bit more comfortable in the hips, and I told him, you know, after it's been two or three years, so this is gonna be his deliberate practice every time that it's, uh, you know, snatch, overhead squat day, back squat, front squat, deliberate practice with finding his comfortable stance for the day, using tempo and range of motion constraints to just be able to find that comfortable groove. Nudge that range of motion threshold, but without having to blast through it. And uh, currently he's on a four day a week program and uh, programmed through the coaches at, at, our, at our gym. And so I'll have correspondence with them if we need to adjust the, the dosage of squats or the full lifts We'll do that, but just kind of monitor. Neither one of these problems are, are debilitating or causing him to lose training time. So we can just kind of be there to monitor, alter positions, alter uh, training constraints. And I, I think that'll make a dent in things long-term if he just is consistent with implementing those strategies. Next up, another male in his 30s, about one week post left knee meniscectomy. So no mechanism of injury, just been dealing with mechanical symptoms in his knee for two or three years, does weightlifting, powerlifting type training, uh, jiu-jitsu type training, does jiu-jitsu, and it was just becoming more and more of a problem. He was losing range of motion, ADLs were becoming affected, I didn't see him during this time. So had the surgery, is orthoscopic, and it was, uh, they just shaved away some, some meniscus, and no weight-bearing restrictions post-surgery, no loading restrictions really at all. The doctor just said, do whatever you do whatever you want to your tolerance. And so what we're gonna start with is, is just some real basic stuff. We're gonna do, uh, currently he's, the, the knee still kind of feels swollen and it, he's still uh, short a decent amount of, of flexion. Extension is fully there with a little bit of pain at end range, but the range of motion is there. 
So it's going to be very tempoed uh, goblet squats or, or uh, any other squat variation with a range of motion constraint. Obviously, we'll dose the load to his tolerance. I think we can be able to push the deadlifts, probably hit a, use a trap bar just to be able to make it as hingy or squatty as we want. Uh, split squats will be in there, probably some single leg hinge variation. Uh, leg extensions so that we can minimize any stress shielding, probably start with isometrics, isometric pushes, isometric holds at uh, various angles. The thing is, it's just the, the joint's still swollen. We, I definitely don't want to increase the swelling and, and, and uh, increase the inflammatory response that's already there, which is there for a reason, but we don't necessarily want to blow that up. So it's going to be real easy with how we dose things. And we're going to use feedback loops. So he'll just check range of motion periodically, maybe after the training session, after an exercise during the training, just to make sure we're not losing flexion, uh, that the body's not kind of fighting back because we want that to go the other way. We want to gain strength and range of motion concurrently as the inflammatory response dies down and the knee heals. So we'll start with two or three days of focused loading in, in that respect. Uh, other things, even you know, as, as rudimentary as like a terminal knee extension in this case, just to load the quad in some capacity, but without having to jam him into that flexion range of motion that doesn't quite have. We'll just nudge that threshold. Next couple weeks, uh, we'll be, like I said, relatively conservative. And I, once the swelling dies down, we'll be able to push things. He's not doing jujitsu right now. We're gonna want, I want the range of motion to normalize before he gets back on the, on the mats. But uh, I'll be monitoring his progress going forward. And then we had uh, another male in his 30s getting left-sided radicular pain. MRI revealed a 13 millimeter disc herniation, uh, L4, L5, and then some other, lots of stenosis, these types of things. Um, the changes, there was no mechanism of injury. He's got a history of right radiculopathy in which he got a, a microdiscectomy in two, in, you know, years ago. He, was, he had dropped foot, the neurological symptoms for months, the whole nine yards. So the, the surgery, he said, was actually a light switch. Had the surgery, foot came back uh, in relatively short order. Pain was almost 95% reduced. So, you know, it's just kind of speaks to sometimes a, a procedure is warranted in, in certain cases. So, you know, we, sometimes we... We put this, we shed the light as the pendulum swings to surgery is never, uh, is never warranted or, or is never an adequate option or appropriate option. And that's not necessarily the case. But now in this case, it's left side. The MRI does reveal some stuff, but likely those things have been there for a while. And his current symptoms have only been there since October when he increased golf. He started playing golf again, a lot of it, and started to get some, some low back pain. And then, um, said that one night a sneeze is what put him over the top. And as silly as that sounds, I actually uh, have found that in the clinic. I've, I've heard that a few times. Uh, a couple hard sneezes when you're already kind of dealing with some stuff back there is enough pressure. And maybe it's just that one of those things that it's the straw that broke the camel's back type of deal, but immediately began to feel radiculopathy or radicular symptoms down the leg, um, lateral, lower leg, lateral, thigh, a bit of drop foot, and we tested that using a dynamometer, uh, dorsiflexion strength, and, and also just heel walking. You can see it just doesn't quite have uh, as much pop there. It was about a, a third weaker uh, using the dynamometer. Uh, left hip abduction was also about a third weaker using the dynamometer. Um, and just overall, just seemed uh, just more of those neurological symptoms. Not as bad as the right side that he had years ago, but definitely dealing with it. Hadn't done anything for three months, uh, nothing but the you know McGill Big Three and that type of thing. That's how he was managing it. We were actually able to, I, I tested the isometric mid-thigh pull and he pulled over uh, 400, 400 pounds, you know, put 400 pounds of force, no pain. It's the hinging and the, and the kind of flexion that he's super, super sensitive to. But if he makes it squatty, if he bends his knees, uh, takes that radiculopathy and that neural tension away. And we, his squat actually looks really good and he's able to squat to full depth. And we did some loaded uh, goblet squats and that felt good. 
And we even did some kettlebell deadlifts and just made them more squatty than maybe you typically would for a hinge type pattern. And that felt good. And by the end of the session, he was able to work into some hinges. So I think with him, we're definitely gonna respect the, the, the radicular symptoms, monitor over time. But what I'm hoping is that we're, we're able to grade exposure to those provocative positions and he's able to gain back uh, his ability to absorb load in those positions, his full range of motion, his ability to actually hinge and bend forward, and uh, ultimately just get that strength back you know, on that side and you know, while the nerve sensitivity dissipates over time, but it's definitely gonna be a process, so we talked about that. Um, and, and so we'll just, we'll see how things go. I think we've got, a, we've got a good plan in place right now. We've got enough things to start with. And again, three months of doing nothing, literally anything is gonna be more. So there's no, there's no need to rush. Uh, we'll take the first couple weeks pretty easy, but I think today was encouraging for him. And then lastly, a uh, female in her 40s, and this is some, someone that I've been working with for a while, and, and she is training to uh, join the Firefighter Academy. So kind of a, a career shift, but she's through a lot of the hard parts. Passed the CPAT test, passed uh, all the written exams, and, and has done all those things. And so she's ready to kind of get into the academy. And, and so we're in the home stretch here, and, and she's in really good shape. Um, just kind of dealing with some long-standing left-sided radicular pain. Uh, sometimes it just stays kind of in the hip area. Sometimes it goes down the leg. Uh, recently developed some elbow pain as we were, we were pushing, admittedly pushing push-ups and pull-up uh, volumes more to get her prepared for a lot of the things that she's gonna see in the academy. And uh, so she, we started to get a little bit of elbow problems that we're gonna manage with some, start with some focused eccentrics of the uh, wrist extensors. We're go going to modify the push-up and pull-up loads, which you already have. Um, and we're gonna take out some of the pulling movements that we were doing that were also lighting her elbow up. And really just, you know, it's like, if the elbow's flared up at this point, we, we, still have some, we still have some tests that she has to pass and some things that she has to do. So we need to be able to do pull-ups and push-ups and, and a, a certain, amount of them. And so we're going to pull back on anything that would flare up the elbow. And if her elbow is going to hurt anyway, we might as well put all that energy into the things that she needs to do. So for the next month or so, it's going to be more of managing her symptoms and trying to push performance and then hopefully being able to dial back and, and address the symptoms. But it's right now it's a fine balance of, of being in shape for what she needs to do and, and managing symptoms. And it's the same with her uh, metabolic conditioning. So she needs to be in some type of, of metabolic shape, aerobic shape, uh, cardiovascular shape, but she's also dealing with some knee pain. And so running, which she's gonna have to do a lot of, and she's got a beat test, and probably several beat tests coming up, but her knee was giving her problems uh, after some overdosing uh, downhill hiking trails. And so running was, Kind of out of the question for a while so we kept her engine high with the bike because the bike was not a problem but now we're we're kind of under the gun from a time perspective and so we need to start dosing back in running and so this is one of those cases where it's you know we want everybody to to be pain free and not not feel their symptoms and and if we base our goals around that sometimes we miss the bigger picture so uh she and i just have these conversations of what's realistic and what's most important right now. And um, obviously managing symptoms and we want those to be as minimal as possible, but also the priority is, is making sure that she can do what she needs to do for, for the next steps in her career. And so we're, we're, we're managing both of those worlds right now. And, and uh, luckily she's got a really good head on her shoulders and she understands that process. And, and I keep close tabs on her as she works through the program that we have. So. Um, it's, it's, it's a fun, it's fun to manage those things and it's, it's, uh, it's, it's challenging, but I think it makes people, I think it makes us better on both ends, you know, her as an athlete and, and just kind of a resilient human and me as a clinician, you know, working through, uh, those cases that are multifactorial, there's just a lot of things at play. So, uh, probably a more long-winded rundown than I anticipated of all those uh, cases, but uh, hopefully 